everybody. Welcome to your Tuesday edition of the Trader Merlin Show. A little depressed today. Warriors game last night was just awful. Actually, it wasn't too bad. It was just we lost at the very end. But uh, come on, Warriors. We need to win that one. Uh, let's see how depressed I am on Wednesday if we win or lose. Anyway, uh, today's show is brought to you by listener questions. That's right. I've been asking for there's specific topics you guys like to cover, things you want to be have addressed, questions about trading, investing, whatever. You know, I'm pretty much open. So I had an interesting question come in from Brendan early this morning, and I thought, you know what, I'll build a show around that. So here is the show topic for today. Brendan says, uh, with a lot of banks trading at low PE ratios, would now be a good time to bottom fish bank stocks? And I thought, well, you know what, let's let's talk about that. And I create a nice little AI graphic here of bottom fishing bank stocks. So <clears throat> if you read the article I wrote for Bar Chart, oh, a month or so ago, probably a month and a half ago now, you know, I focused on kind of that that mentality of there's blood in the water, you know, now's the time to buy because the panic is there. However, if you are going to even entertain this question of should you buy bank stocks right now or bottom fish for them, you have to ask yourself, what is your appetite for risk? So right away, Brendan, I would say, how how risk prone do you want to be? Because clearly at this moment in time, and this may change or will change going forward, but right now banking stocks are the most volatile segment of the market. You could even take biotechs and they laugh at um, how crazy the, the bank stocks are at this moment in time. So first off, before you even think about it, decide for yourself how much capital you want to allocate of your portfolio to bank stocks, because honestly, it's just crazy. Um, Margaret says, is uh, Buffett bottom fishing right now? Here's the thing. If you, if you believe what Warren Buffett says and follow what Warren Buffett says, you have to remember that he is using the media to his advantage. So what Warren Buffett will not do is he will not say, I'm buying something right now. He won't do that. Because he doesn't have to report anything for the quarter. Once the quarter is done, then it shows up in his statements for you know Berkshire Hathaway what uh, Warren Buffett has actually done. So if you find him saying, "Hey, yes, I'm interested in buying bank stocks," that means he's been bought. He bought it last quarter. So you're already going to be late to the party, no matter what he says. There's classic examples of him with silver, where he actually was buying silver and buying silver and buying silver, and he never said a word. And then it got to a point where he was on media, he built his whole position in silver, and it was transparent because he had to disclose his holdings. And he goes, yeah, I, I, I like silver. Boom, silver shot up. So remember, if he says he's buying banks, he's already bought them, he's already in a position, uh, getting the, the retail investor to pump that posi position up even more. So is he buying them, bottom fishing? I don't know, I don't think they're down low enough yet. I, I'm pretty sure that Warren Buffett and, um, and his team are out looking at, are there any real good value plays here? What I'm not going to get into, because it's not my area of expertise, is I'm not going to peel back the onion of fundamentals and look at all the different financial metrics for all these banks. Uh, maybe we can bring on Colin Tedders of the investment or the investor channel to do that, because that's that's his bread and butter. He loves that stuff. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll venture down that road. So I'm just looking at it from a high level, almost philosophical perspective of, of what should we be thinking about these bank stocks, looking at some of the information out there with capital risk, liquidity risk, uh, and which ones face the most challenges going forward. So let me start off with a, a real quick little, I guess two things to understand here is the main area, which I'm assuming that Brennan was, would be like to, to invest in now is regional banks, which are under a tremendous amount of pressure. And there's two main factors. One is going to be called liquidity risk. And the other one's capital risk. Now with liquidity risk, it's just basically, can they sustain a run in the bank, right? Is there is there enough money available, liquid enough, so they can you know, deal with the depositors wanting their money back? I think that for the most part, most of the liquidity risk is already factored out of this system. I, I, th I think we've already seen the liquidity stuff already play out, right? If you're somebody who's got $100 million sitting in a regional bank, you probably already move that to some place that might be a little more stable. So my guess is that most of the, the liquidity risk is gone. The other part is capital risk. And that is that many of these banks have taken on long-term debt obligations, which of course the yield has dropped significantly on those, causing them to lose money. Now, theoretically, they haven't lost yet unless they're forced to sell. So a capitalization issue would be, are they upside down on investments to such a degree that if they're forced to sell those investments to regenerate cash for the customer withdrawals, 
will that shut them down? Will that be the piece that breaks the camel's back, like, or the straw that breaks the camel's back, like it was for uh, Silicon Valley Bank? So that was predominantly because of long-term debt obligations. They borrowed short-term, they lended long-term, and all of a sudden that yield curve flipped. They're borrowing at a higher rate and lending out longer. That's just guaranteed to lose you money over time, plus the premium for those bonds they had dropped significantly. So that, that to me is the, the fundamental question is when you look at these ones, what's the liquidity risk and what is the, the capital risk for any of these regional banks? Now, to go to Brendan's point, he said, uh, many of these have very low PE ratios would now be a good time to bottom fish. And if you want to know more about uh, the PE ratios, I will bring up a filter for you. This is from finviz.com. And... You notice uh, I went up to the top here as a screener and I've changed three criteria. I did the financial sector, I did regional banks, and then I said, show me the stuff that's over 1 million shares traded per day. And again, you could go lower than that, but if I'm buying something, I wanna make sure that I have some liquidity in those ones. I wanna make sure that I got um, the ability to you know, buy and sell with a good amount of shares without having too much of a problem. And you'll notice a whole bunch of banks that are very familiar with it. There's your Deutsche Bank with a PE of 3.99. Uh, you've got Zion Bank shares, which a lot of people are talking about as having uh, a capital and liquidity risk right now, 4.59 PE. These are obviously very, 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 very low liquidity ratios or low PE ratios. However, these are typically TTM, trailing 12 months. So it's going to take the earnings for the trailing 12 months and then the current price. Now, obviously, these regional bank stocks have been crushed. So the prices are really low and the earnings are reflected of last quarter. So these PE ratios are gonna are gonna change here dramatically as more and more of these banks start reporting earnings and the impact of all the financial crisis uh, starts to impact their bank statements a little bit more down the road. So you know you see some very familiar names on there. I'm not uh, familiar with a lot of them. I actually really was just looking at Huntington Bank shares and Zion is kind of saying the big regional banks here. You can see their market capitalization at three billion there for Zion and for uh, Huntington Bank shares, 13 billion. There certainly are some bigger ones. I'll sort here by market cap. So your regional bank, biggest one, uh, HDFC, which has a reasonable PE ratio of 25.91. So if that's your main uh, factor for making your investment decision, Brendan, the answer is yes, there are some very attractive PE ratios. However, I personally feel that that's going to be biased. That is going to be delayed information. And as probably next quarter's earnings come out, that'll all recalibrate and those PE ratios might get back to somewhat uh, of a sense of normal because earnings are going to decline significantly. But now the PE ratio is using earnings from the previous quarter, which were much, much better. So from that factor, no. The other piece here is you know, who has the liquidity risk, right? Which one might there be a run on the banks? And generally that's going to circulate around uninsured deposits. So which banks have the highest level of uninsured deposits? Um, I don't know if you guys use Visual Capitalist. I'm a huge fan of Visual Capitalist. They do some amazing uh, graphics. They actually have a, they produced a book a couple years ago that I actually bought a few of them to give out as friends. I wish they would do it every year. Uh, but here is a very interesting graphic. This was about a month ago. So it's, it's definitely old information at this point. But what it did is it just runs through and shows you the U.S. banks with the most uninsured deposits. What that means is deposits that are over $250,000 in those accounts. And, you know, Silicon Valley Bank was leading the list at 93.8% of their uh, depositors were uninsured. That is, that's crazy. That is ridiculous. But you notice there's some other big names here. Bank of New York Mellon, State Street, Signature Bank. Of course, Signature and Silicon Valley are done. You also have Northern Trust. Um, I'll, I'll look at the 70% mark. It's kind of a threshold where it gets too much. City National Bank, HSBC, CIBC, and Citibank are all in that above 70 category. Now, when I wrote this article for Bar Chart, you know, I was looking at JP Morgan and I thought to myself, that's one of the reasons I wanted JP Morgan is, yeah, 52% of those deposits are uninsured, but that means that the vast majority of people, or a large portion of those people won't be pulling deposits out. Now, um, you know, this is just one small piece that you could be using to help you with that and with that decision of saying, well, you know, which banks would I want to get involved with here? You know, there's your Huntington Bank shares, which based off of this, was it 45.6% of those deposits were uninsured? That should be relatively safe in this market environment. Look, even Goldman Sachs is running at 47.6. So there still are some some big names there. Bank of America is at 46.1, which is part of the fact, part of the reasons why I put it on my list of the um 
three that I was going to be buying or that I bought at that moment in time. I'm no longer in any of those positions. I was a short-term swing trade on those. Anyway, so that's some basic stuff. And I guess now the ultimate uh, determination is going to be looking at some of those companies from a technical perspective. Now, I will say this before I dive into it. I, I've been looking at some of these thinking maybe I'll jump back in and find some bottom, feed, bottom fishing here like uh, Brendan points out, just maybe some value plays. But I've walked away from that idea. The, the, the FRC, which is now FRCB shares that I own, um, you know, that's in bankruptcy. I'll bring that up here for you. Kind of strange to actually see FRCB. Even though it was bought by JP Morgan, um, you know, it's still trading now. So I have a bunch of shares at 44 cents. Ooh, we made 11% today on the upside. If it got to, to uh, six bucks, then I'd be happy. But <laughs> we're down at 44 cents. But as you can actually say, I had FRC in my holdings. Now it's changed to FRCB and it's still trading. It didn't it go to zero? Yeah, that's one I'm not sh I don't I don't understand that myself, Ganesh. Um, typically when these companies get bought up, all the shares and everything transfer over to JP Morgan in this case. But I remember in reading through the the details of the deal, there were some pieces that JP Morgan didn't buy. They didn't buy all of it. And maybe the remaining pieces are what's left here to publicly trade. I'm not sure. Um, why it's still trading. I still have my shares. I'll hold them for another week or so and, and maybe just unload those and, and take a little bit of a, or take a, a significant loss here and maybe make a little bit of profit back on my position. But that's uh, First Republic is currently trading. It's FRCB. Typically when you get the B added on, it means it's going through bankruptcy. Uh, that happened for Silicon Valley as well. And I think Signature had a bankruptcy share that was trading for a while. So... Uh, I'm not interested in buying any of these at this moment. I don't really just want, I don't want to allocate capital to the, the regional banks. I just don't, I just don't trust it. You know, after hearing the statements from Jerome Powell and Janet Yellen saying how they're going to bail out everybody. And then we had FRC. Um, and, and right now I believe personally that you look at something like PacWest, right? So here's PACW. I think a lot of this right now is, is misinformation being spread by social media your Wall Street bets, your Reddit chat rooms, <laughs> Oliver, it's a trap. I agree. I'm, I'm walking away from it. I'm just, just, I feel it's safer for me at this point because I might be emotionally trading, revenge trading because of my uh, First Republic losses. But um, I, I think that you're just, you have to be susceptible or you are susceptible to major swings and fluctuations in the prices here. And at this point, it's just not for me, even though you do see some stuff out there, as Brendan points out, with great PE ratios. I just don't really see anything on there that uh, I'm attracted to, except some of the bigger bank names, which I feel have more stability. Again, you know, here's Charles Schwab, which has not been able to get its feet back on the ground. It just kind of keeps drifting lower and lower and lower. So I'm going to keep this on my radar. Uh, if it does start to make some new highs, I might actually buy back into Charles Schwab because I think that they're going to be okay. Um, Huntington Bank Shares was another one, but you know, from my reading, Huntington Bank Shares has more exposure to commercial real estate loans, which I think is the next shoe to drop here. Um, what else was on the list here? So we had Zion, we had Huntington Bank Shares. Um, you know, someone asked about Wells Fargo last week, and well, you know, Wells Fargo is in that big category of big banks. You know, it didn't really suffer like some of the other ones. Certainly had a, a, a sell-off, but um, nowhere near as bad as like Huntington Bank Shares or First Republic. Uh, Citibank would be another one on that list, kind of the big giant mega cap firms, but this isn't really regional bank. This is your mega cap stuff. So I, if you wanted to, Brendan, I would say run through this list here of regional banks, sort them by your PE ratio if that's what you're going off of, and then just look technically, you know, are, are these companies from a technical perspective that you want to own? And if you are a fundamental analysis guy, then check out and see if they make sense from a fundamentals perspective. So let's go... Uh, I'm going to look at just the top three here, which are First Foundation, First Republic Bank Corp, and Western Alliance Bank Corporation, just to see out of those three, with the lowest PE ratio, is there anything that you might be interested in? So let's go FFWM. Uh, uh, I would have to say negative Ghost Rider. This thing looks bad, bad, and even badder, if that's proper grammar. You know, you're up at 17 back in February. Now you're kissing $4.33, which obviously is going to skew that PE ratio until the next earnings come out. So you notice that their earnings did come out here on the 27th, but that's still not going to incorporate a lot of the financial losses. The next next earnings announcement is the one that really reflect there. So I, I would look at this one and go, no, not interested. It, it 
just looks like this thing's heading to zero just with its trajectory. That's uh, FFWM. Let's look at uh, FRBK, another very low PE ratio stock, which looks like it was broken long before the banking crisis hit. I mean, this thing was up at six bucks all the way back in March of 2022, and it hasn't looked back since. So I don't care whether it's a banking crisis or not, this stock looks bad, and I would probably leave that one alone. Finally, this one uh, got hit by a lot of social media chatter. You can see the bad EKG part here. It looks like someone hit it with a defibrillator. You have that huge spike down back in March where it went from $75, $77 all the way down to a low of 7 bucks. Got to love a 90% drop. Uh, and we had a similar spike here just a week ago based off of uh, talk about them going under, but that was unsubstantiated. And them and PacWest bounced back very, very quickly on that one. So... I don't know. I I don't personally think it's time to go bottom fishing on these bad boys. I think you wait and see a little bit longer because I don't think we're out of the woods yet. We still have the, the liquidity crisis issue. We still have the capital crisis issue. Uh, and now you're facing lending issues, meaning the capital requirements for banks are going to start to tighten up a little bit. And their lending is going to tighten up a little bit. And that could hit the bottom line even more. So I, I still think you're... Uh, looking at some tr for some trouble here in these bank stocks. Now, there was one other interesting question that came in that related to that same topic, which was this one from Leslie. Uh, thank you, Leslie. How would a ban on shorting help the current banking crisis? Well, first off, I'm not a fan of it. Uh, I believe that you should have a free market and let the market do what it needs to do to establish a fair and even price for everybody, as opposed to being manipulated. However, we live in the United States, probably the most manipulated financial market in the world. Thank you, Federal Reserve and Treasury Department and all that stuff. But They've done this before. They did this back in uh, 2008 when we had our financial crisis. Now it's just the banking crisis. When we had our financial crisis back then, they would not allow you to short bank stocks and financial, financial companies. And what that does is it now takes away one element of pressure for selling. And they're just trying to prevent people from pushing these markets down even further. Look, a lot of these banks probably deserve valuations that are much lower. And therefore, people are shorting it. And to me, that's free market. You should be able to. Um, the truth of the matter is this. They may not be able to short shares outright, but big institutions will create derivative products that allow them to synthetically short any of these companies. So the only one that this is going to impact is predominantly the retail traders, in my opinion. Um, does it do any good? Well, it does put pressure on things to go up. Because if you remove the short sell, you, there's really four actions that you can take in, in trading a uh, stock, right? You can buy that security long. You can sell that security short. Um, you can buy to cover your short position. And you can sell to close your long position. So you have two sells and you have two buy equations, right? If you remove short selling, you are taking away one of those four variables. You're taking away the um sell short perspective so now you have two buying opportunities buy to cover and just buy to open outright and you have sell to close so what that does is theoretically that puts more buying pressure on the markets helps stabilize prices and will prevent those shares from sliding further that's the general principle um would it help it'll probably help stabilize the bank stocks and give them a little more upside movement which you know, would go back to support Brendan's argument about bottom fishing. However, it has not been implemented. The SEC would make that call. Um, hasn't really pursued it. You know, President Biden has said, you know, we should do this, but the SEC doesn't seem to have taken action on that one, and I don't think it'll. Uh, I don't think it'll go through. But you never know. I think we're already a little bit past that. So uh, typically, when you ban shorting, it puts upside pressure on whatever security or sector it is because now you've removed one aspect of selling and that means two buying pressures and one selling pressure all right so that's my my two cents on bottom fishing uh that's pretty much it i'm definitely a strong from my category i'm a, a strong no at this point you know if you do start to see uh the talk track that politicians are now gonna or that the sec is gonna ban short selling I might change my tune a little bit. I might put a little bit of capital back into some of these bank stocks, um, probably with doing it with call options and probably doing a long dated call option, buying myself some time to let these things bounce up. But uh, you know, when they make that announcement, their premium for those call options is going to probably surge as well because a lot of people will be wanting 
to buy those call options. So the question is, do you take the chance now and buy deep out of the money call options because they might ban short selling and you get get a bounce up in financials or wait till they make the announcement? Yeah, that, that's the tough call right there. Okay, uh, that'll do it for that portion. What did I see? So Bill says, um, <laughs> you got your Bitcoin moved, good. I'm glad you got that all taken care of. You gotta get that Bitcoin safe and off those exchanges, get them onto a ledger and keep them track. Uh, I'm still working on Binance. So Binance, as you guys know, is not un not releasing the staking Ethereum, staked Ethereum that they have on file. That's supposed to happen the next week. Uh, fingers crossed we get that by next weekend, which would be great for me. Uh, when that happens, I'll let you know how, when, where, and what I do with my Ethereum to get it off of those exchanges. It'll probably going to go to cold storage, and I will take control of it from there. Um, all right. So let me run through our markets here just to have a little bit of a recap of what happened out there today from the overall perspective of our top seven. And then I'm open to whatever questions you guys have, and then we'll uh, wrap things up. I am looking forward to having Scott McCormick on the program tomorrow to talk about bonds, equities, commodities, currencies, et cetera. So if you have anything you want to add or questions for him, please feel free to email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. All right, uh, on the list of things today, we'll start things off with the NASDAQ 100, which a lot of people were looking at the NASDAQ feeling like, uh-oh, you know, or looking at the markets overall and saying, uh-oh, the banking sector is going to weigh on it and that's pulling things down. And we, we have that uncertainty out there, which uh, I think hurt quite a lot of market segments today. Now, we talked about the NASDAQ hitting that overhead supply level. It literally hit it to the T to, uh, yesterday and now has been selling off from it. We'll see if we get some follow through. If you notice, we have had this kind of uptrend line. I know it's going to be an aggressive one for those of you that are trend line followers. You know, you look right about through here. And if I cut off those tails, you know, that's your upward trend line. I know that seems extremely sharp and very steep um, uptrend line. But that's one to keep an eye on. You know, one, and what I would do is I'm waiting for a retest here of the NASDAQ. And my guess is you'll probably see it drift all the way down to maybe 13,000. 13, uh, that would be a slight break of that trend line. So either this trend line is going to hold, my 13,000 level is going to hold. If not, then all of a sudden we're going to break that and we'll start seeing, you know, 12,8 and maybe some of these other levels lower. So even though it looks really strong right now, it's due for a pullback. Today you had a down day of 0.66% on it. Let's see if there's any follow through from that and get us back down to this trend line. My guess is you'll probably come back down to the trend line before moving back up, but I do see a pullback coming. Uh, S&P 500, similar picture, slight rollover, right? We had that um, giant update on Friday followed by hesitation on Monday. Typically that type of thing leads to a sell-off day, which we got today. Uh, S&P was down 0.45%, or at least that's what it's down right now to 41.34. Now, the Russell 2000, which I just want to fall apart, this tank, drop, would you? It didn't. 0.34%. So, a very slight decline here for the Russell 2000. It's 1755. Um, I still like the, the bearishness of this. It has not been able to make new highs. It seems like it tries and then just kind of falters and drifts lower. I know um, Tom's waiting for it to stay within this range or, or hoping it stays within this range, and, and it might. But I do think you'll see it challenge that 1645 mark, which is the lower end of our uh, wide range here on the Russell 2000. The trend is looking rather weak and just can't seem to get momentum to the upside. Almost to the podium, here's your Dow. Nothing that I see here on the Dow really makes me feel confident about making any trade either way. It was down 0.14% today, but really a small uneventful day, so I'll leave that one alone. 33,637 where the Dow closed at. All right, now to the Getting a little bit better here. We've got gold. Start things off with GLD as our bronze medal winner. 2042 is where it's at right now. Still staying above that 2000 mark, which is certainly a positive sign. The longer it does that, the more likely it will remain above 2000. You had a gain of 0.48%, so just nine bucks. I'm being nice to the rut, Tom. I'm definitely being nice to the rut. And I, I just, it just looks weak. I think you'll challenge the bottom end in that range, and then I hope it bounces for you. How about that? Um, from a technical perspective, though, you know, we had that break of the high on May 4th. Looked nice and then retraced. Uh, we've already had a couple breakouts here. We had this as a flag pattern for a little while. And we'll see if this continues on up. I, again, I am bullish. I think that you're going to see more follow through. I think we'll challenge that high at 2080 that we recently hit and uh, slowly break through that. So long on gold. Um, I'm long physical gold. I don't own any ETFs or futures right now. But uh, I hope maybe to add some to my position. Crude oil was your second place 
Ooh, finisher silver again i've got that little yellow box mapped out right there where i think that that's where we're going to head back up to uh kind of hit the same high that we achieved yesterday which is right around that 73 71 mark uh, but i do think you're going to see this move up a little bit further here and get up to about that 75 50 so we got about another uh, buck 80 of room to run in my opinion before we start to see a sell-off here from that overhead supply zone that goes back to april of this year and the big winner, which was just the big loser, so really nothing too big here. We talked about Bitcoin yesterday and looked at some of the, the potential head and shoulder aspects to it. I personally don't see it's a head and shoulder. Some of you do. That's that's fine. It's all how you trade it. Um, today, you know, you look at a 1.48% move to the upside. It's like, oh, yay, great. Well, coming on the heels of yesterday's big decline in Bitcoin, you know, that doesn't seem so rosy, but uh, we'll take it. 27,770 is where we ended up today for Bitcoin. Again, up 1.48%. Um, I'm just kind of waiting to see what happens here. I'm, again, I'm going to record this video for barchart.com tonight. Uh, I'm going to send it over there and, and we'll see if they like what I've recorded and then hopefully uh, they'll take that video and then post that one here over the next couple of days. But it really maps out the future for Bitcoin here. And there's some really interesting pieces that repeat over and over and over again on Bitcoin. As you guys know, I'm a pattern person. I like, I like to look for pattern recognition, look for head and shoulders, ascending triangles, bull flags, you know, things like that. Because there's a almost a, an ingrained response for those types of patterns because so many people are looking for those. And, you know, Bitcoin's pattern right now doesn't look great, but there are some much bigger macro pictures here that I want to um, make you guys aware of. And I'll do that in that video that I did for Bar Chart, which I'll post the link in the next, as soon as it happens, I'll post that link for you on uh on my social media channels as well as in this group uh last couple pieces here dollar index since i've been talking about the dollar kind of flatlining and basing right around this 101.22 uh nice little move up today but really until it gets above 102.40 uh, i still think that there's downward pressure on the dollar index it's got to start making some new highs for me to change my mind um, if it keeps making lower highs great and further verifies or substantiates my opinion that, that you're going to see this thing drift to the south side and lastly Look at our 10-year bond. Yields, yields didn't really do much today, so there's really not much to talk about there. I could scroll down through some of the major markets, but uh, I really don't see anything that's that exciting um, with the broad broad markets. So I'll have to wrap it up with that. All right, uh, one of the questions I see here, Jeff says, going short is only good for AMC and GameStop. Well, I think you would all agree that GameStop and AMC do not in any way, shape, or form pose a systemic risk, right? Let, let, let the gamblers play with GameStop and AMC. You know, it's just, it's just silliness in my opinion. Um, so if those have problems, they don't care. They'll implode and it just hurts that small little ecosystem within their ticker symbol. But if we have the broader banking sector under attack, which it seems like it has been, uh, and more institutional money is pushing down the entire sector, that could have more of a systemic impact, right? So that's one that the, the regulators are going to protect. Um, yeah, that's the one that regulators are going to protect, is making sure that the banking sector doesn't get messed with. Because, I mean, we have a whole uh, Federal Reserve to protect the banks, so we got to make sure the banks are safe. Um, you know, heaven forbid we should start to see a short selling happen on pharmaceuticals. Well, it's happened. You don't put a ban on short selling pharmaceutical stocks. It's only really going to happen to bank stocks. I don't. I won't. I don't foresee them short, uh, preventing shorting on tech stocks. There's just too many of them out there. But the bank stocks are systemic risk to the economy. Ganesh says uh, you had mentioned in previous videos that money will move into Bitcoin due to banking crisis as a way to park money. Why can't why can't it be parked on good stocks or indexes with lesser volatility? Oh, it absolutely can, Ganesh. Absolutely. It, it, without question, that's where a lot of the money is going is into other market segments, which may provide stability for someone's capital. But for those looking to, as a store of value, and, and you know, you could look at your Michael Saylors, and instead of keeping money at a bank, which is what typically a company like MicroStrategy would do, right? They would keep their liquid cash sitting at a bank, Silicon Valley Bank or JP Morgan or something like that. Um, you look at you look at Apple. Right, Apple's got billions of dollars. I am pretty sure a lot of that, maybe not all, but a lot of that is sitting at different financial firms that there is some potential risk there. 
And if there was a run on those banks, you know, there could be some significant losses. So again, the banks maintain the systemic risk piece. So if you are someone who's got a lot of capital, um, specifically, you know, retained earnings and just cash on your books, where do you put it? And where do you park that? Uh, if, you're, if you understand the mechanics of Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin with your cash actually helps your cause because if you're buying billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin, you're going to drive the price of Bitcoin up, which will bring in more people because they want to join the rally. So it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, we don't, um, we don't know exactly what the impacts are of all of those purchases, right? When, when I look at something like Bitcoin and the potential flood of money coming into Bitcoin, what's the result of all that? Like how much does a billion dollars worth of purchase push up Bitcoin's price chart? Th that we just don't know. Um, I'd also think you're going to start to see, and we saw it a few years back with Tesla and MicroStrategy and Overstock where companies were actually holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet. If that starts to increase, and let's just say we see a 1% increase in the amount of companies that are holding Bitcoin or digital assets on their balance sheet because they're worried about the financial system, the price of Bitcoin is going to soar as well. Um, yeah, no, I get it, Ganesh. It, it, money's going to go somewhere, right? Money's going to go somewhere. And at this point, there's a lot of people who really feel that um, that the banks are overly manipulated and they even though they're totally manipulated and will argue controlled by the fed there's still an air of risk there they can seize your assets right if i'm apple and i take let me just real quickly because i want to know off the top of my head let's go and see how much cash apple has um oops go to yahoo since that's the easiest one for me we'll go to finance here and no i'm not going to talk about trump and his sex abuse scandal i don't care um Apple. So here's Apple. Just to see how much cash they have on hand. Okay, we'll go to statistics. Scroll down here and we see that they have total cash. Oh, what? Wow, that's weird. Uh, this, There's so much stuff here that's hidden. This used to all be available. I don't know why this is all hidden like this, but... Um, <laughs> Doesn't doesn't show all their EBITDA and net income, all this stuff. The income statement's completely blank. That is very the first time I've ever seen that. Uh, anyway, I know it's billions of dollars, and so we start to see a, a financial companies that have cash. If it's in a bank and that bank goes under, they could lose everything. So why not go to something like Bitcoin, which cannot be seized by the government? which cannot be manipulated, meaning they can't print more or less Bitcoin. There's a very clear, predictable um, path for Bitcoin, right? There's an emission schedule which says that 6.25 Bitcoin are created every, every 10 minutes, and that will happen until April of next year. Thank you, Ganesh. Was it on a, it, maybe I'll just hit refresh. That's so weird that it showed up on Yahoo. Yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Right, Ricardo, it's a ton of money. It just for some reason didn't show up here. So yeah, I, I remember it being a high number like that. But imagine if you're Apple, what the hell do you do with $50 billion? You're not putting that at JP Morgan. I mean, you have to have some very clear arrangements here. <laughs> Tucker is back. You have to have some very clear arrangements with these financial firms to protect that capital. You know, Apple is not out there saying, hey, we need to invest this and, and get... 5% rate of return on it. They want cash available to be making acquisitions and corporate growth. If they need to grow and expand their business, whether that's uh, buying other companies or expanding facilities or R&D, they need that capital for that. So you know that, that needs to be relatively low risk. Well, putting it in any of these regional banks or even the mega banks right now may be a problem. So I think it's uh, it would not be a bad idea to put it into a crypto project like Bitcoin, which is gaining popularity, gaining traction. Uh, and the more that that happens, the higher that price will go. As we saw with Elon Musk and Tesla, when they bought Bitcoin, you know, there were some pretty large fluctuations. I believe that um, Elon's average price is $27,000 on his Bitcoin. So at least he's right back to break even. But at one point, you know, we're down at, at 15,000. They were underwater for quite a big move. Um, you would need a really big, <laughs> big mattress for all that cash. Yeah. You know, what's crazy is, can you imagine how much space $51 billion would take up worth of physical currency? I mean, that's like a massive amount of storage for that. Whereas I could have $51 billion in cash in Bitcoin sitting on my thumb drive and 
you know, so there's, you have, the access goes to your CFO and maybe two other people. You can set up multi-sig accounts. It's just a safer way to store large amounts of money, but you're not going to be getting a yield. You're not going to be earning a rate of return in interest, but you are subject to the fluctuations in Bitcoin. But I tell you what, I think everybody here would clearly agree with me that if Apple even bought $10 billion worth of Bitcoin, that the Bitcoin price is going to start to go parabolic. Because you have to understand, right now, the maximum that can ever exist for Bitcoin is 21 million. The estimates are that 6 million have already been lost, meaning lost private keys, so it'll be unaccessible. That means we'll only ever have 15 million Bitcoin and more Bitcoin are being lost every day because people in their private keys. Of that 15 million, you probably only have maybe half of that is tradable, meaning it's on exchanges. Because stuff like mine, my Bitcoin, that's not on exchange. It's not trade. You can't buy my Bitcoin. Oh, actually, that's wrong. Somebody here could offer me and say, hey, I'll pay you $100,000 for your Bitcoin right now. And I would sell you right now my Bitcoin at $100,000 a piece. And then I would go buy it on an exchange for $27,000. But um, no one, my, my, my Bitcoin that I own is not liquid. It's, it has nothing to do with the liquidity in the marketplace. It's off the books. So the more that's on exchanges the more liquidity there is for Bitcoin. The less there is on exchanges, and we've been seeing more Bitcoin being pulled off of the exchanges lately, just because people are afraid of exchanges, that means that there's fewer on exchanges for people to buy, right? Because where do you think Coinbase is going to buy their Bitcoin from? You're, you're going to buy it from the open market. You're going to buy it from somebody there that's selling Bitcoin. So the more that comes off those exchanges, the more likely Bitcoin will rise. So if, if uh, Apple, hell, if they even bought a billion dollars worth, uh, would be insane move on the price of Bitcoin. Anyway, um, wrap up there. Let's see. Do I have any other questions? I didn't see any questions that came through there. Oh, you know what? I didn't look at real quickly. One sec. Let me um, let me go and pull up the YouTube channel because I forgot to write down the, uh, the questions that came through on the YouTube channel today. My bad. Sorry about that. John D says, Apple is big enough to move the Bitcoin market and its brand makes it strong influence. Right. And they haven't bought Bitcoin yet. Let's make clear. If they did, though, woo, lordy, it would be crazy. Okay. So there were no questions that came in from uh, the YouTube channel. Just, just check and make sure. I always like to uh, give those priority from an answering perspective. Uh, Mamon says, work face, workforce participation is more important than the unemployment figures. It is now. Right. It is definitely now. Uh, we hear John O'Donnell talk a lot about that on this program. All right, uh, that pretty much does it for me. I got Alan. I'll get your CRISPR question. I know you wanted to ask me. Uh, you want me to look into CRISPR, and I, I do want to dig into that a little bit more. I think that's a very interesting piece going forward. Is DNA modification, you know, genetically modifying the human genome? That is very interesting. Uh, I feel like it's us playing God. I think that could be a little bit dangerous. You don't know what you're going to get, but um, oh, why not? Okay, so let's go to your um, earnings and economic calendar for tomorrow. I'll start things off with the economic calendar because we do have some good stuff happening tomorrow. Some very exciting things to be sure. You notice up there at the top, 5.30 a.m. Pacific time, 8.30 a.m. Eastern for you guys on the East Coast. You have the consumer price index numbers coming out. Now, what I find interesting is the year-over-year -year growth. You can see there's a CPI M slash M, which is expected to jump from 0.1 to 0.4%. And then there's also the CPI Y slash Y, which is year-over-year. -year, and they're expecting that to stay the same. So it'll be interesting to see how those numbers come out, uh, an increase in the month-over-month, -month, but the yearly staying the same. Okay. Uh, you also have the core CPI numbers come out, which is taking out food and energy. That's expected to decline. So... I guess, good news there from the core CPI perspective. And, and again, this data here is going to be highly influential on Jerome Powell and the FOMC's decision to raise or to stop raising rates at that June 14th meeting. Uh, and that's pretty much it. We have a bond auction tomorrow. You have a Bank of Japan uh, coming out with their Bank of Japan summary of opinions, as well as bank lending. And that's pretty much it. Earnings counter for tomorrow. Oh, old Disney reporting earnings. The D to the I to the S will be reporting. That's aftermarket close tomorrow. Technically, Disney hasn't been the most exciting. It's just been trending up since the middle of March, um, but no real phenomenal patterns there. It actually has what's called a bearish harami today. Bearish harami. Ugh. 
That might be a little bit of a, a foreshadowing for tomorrow's earnings, but I wouldn't trade that, guys. Be careful. That one will be dangerous. You also have the trade desk. TTD will be reporting earnings, one of Larry Jacobson's personal favorites, which has still a beautiful uptrend since the beginning of the year, uh, going from roughly 41 bucks all the way up to uh, right now 64 So we've uh, increased 25 bucks per share on that bad boy. And lastly, you've got drugs. Drugs. Teva. TEVA, one of my first things I had to analyze when I worked for a financial planning company was Table Pharmaceuticals. Somebody worked for the company and just had millions of shares. It was crazy. They were very, very, very wealthy. Um, Lakers, one went away from the Western Conference Finals. Well, you know who else was one went away from the next round in the playoffs? That would be the Sacramento Kings. And they lost three in a row. So um, I'm not going to count my chickens before they hatch, but I still don't rule out the Golden State Warriors. My guess is they'll probably win the next, the Warriors will win this game on Wednesday. And then, boy, if they beat them in LA, if the Warriors beat them in LA, which they should have done last night, it was just atrocious shooting there at the end and some bad mistakes. Um, we should have won there at the end. I still think Warriors are going to pull this one out. I do. I've just, I've seen it happen so many times. They actually have a great record when they're losing in the playoff rounds. So they tend to come back and make statements. So I think the Lakers are going to go the same way as the Sacramento Kings, and they're up on a little pedestal right now. LeBron, oh, yeah, I'm going to flop over here and make some penalties, and then maybe we'll make it to the playoffs. Eh, you're going to lose. You're out. Beat it. Anyway, uh, tomorrow we're going to have Scott McCormick on the program. Bonds, equities, currencies, commodities will be the topic du jour, so you don't get to listen to me talk for an hour. You get to listen to somebody who is far more intelligent than me, uh, Scott McCormick, one of my personal favorites. He's a chartered market technician, so when it comes to the ins and outs of technical analysis, he knows it all. He literally has a degree in it. So if you guys have any questions you want answered for uh, tomorrow's show, email me, tradermarillon at gmail.com or put it down below the YouTube video as many of you do. Would love to see uh, your comments and, and what you want us to talk about on tomorrow's show. But it should be a fun one. Scott's always a great time. That said, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Hope you have a great evening and I will see you all tomorrow. Take care.